our subject is God's knowledge compared with ours. The knowledge of God. Anna, the mother of Samuel, the last of the judges, the first of the prophets, it's often said. She said, talk no more exceeding proudly, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed, the knowledge of God. How little people know about the knowledge of God. That's our theme. The human race is incredibly proud. So many reject the giver of the gift and faculty of reason. Human knowledge is great, but God's, obviously, is far, far greater. There can be no comparison. Human knowledge is fallible. Human knowledge constantly changes. Human knowledge is very partial. God's is immeasurable. Knowledge, the word knowledge, it's used so many times throughout the length of the Bible. It uh, basically means, in the Hebrew, observation, recognition. In the Greek New Testament, it means to have in mind. It's connected with the Greek word for mind. To have in mind, knowledge, what we know, what we remember. Animals have some knowledge, but not intellectual awareness to be compared with ours, let alone God's. Animals have knowledge, but they have no reasoning faculty so far as anybody can determine or tell, and certainly no moral discernment. Their knowledge is of a far inferior order. Their knowledge is to do with their instincts and what's good for them and what will gain them life and food and so on. The ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib. It's in their interests, those creatures, to know those basic things. But discernment, distinctions, making distinctions, the power of reason, moral knowledge and discernment, well, human knowledge is a million miles higher than anything that can be described as knowledge in the animal kingdom. But God's knowledge is vastly higher still, and it's exclusive to himself, the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all equally infinite in knowledge. Let me say some things about the knowledge of God. It's a tremendous theme. God's knowledge is, as I've mentioned, infinite. The scripture says there is no searching of his understanding. There is no limit. His knowledge is perfect, obviously. Otherwise, he would not be God, who is perfect. He makes no mistakes. Every utterance, every piece of knowledge in God is infallible and entire and complete. There are no shadow areas. Man's very puny, limited knowledge by comparison well, when man is at his best and he thinks he understands some system, some mechanism in biology or in some aspect of the operation of the universe, yet there's always a great area he doesn't know or which he gets wrong. That's inevitable. And he's constantly searching and discovering and looking. There are no doubtful areas in God's knowledge. He knows all substances. He knows all mechanisms. He knows all reactions. He designed them. He made them in the first place. He knows the remotest galaxies. They're all under his control, all created by him. The tiniest particles, every system. He is a designer God, and he made all things. It's incredible, the detail in life. Medical scientists are constantly rolling back the frontiers of knowledge and discovering fresh aspects to different systems. They know today far more than they knew 20 years ago concerning 
thousands of oh, microscopic chemical reactions, things that were never observed in the past, explanations for different things that go wrong or that happen within the body and other biological systems. And here we are, the human race. God has just done it, made it. And here we are just nibbling at the edge of it, trying to find it out, trying to add to our knowledge of it. We're inquirers. He alone has perfect knowledge. God's knowledge, let me say, dear friends, is an all-seeing knowledge. Nothing can obstruct him if we want to know things. All manner of obstructions prevent us finding out entirely what we would like to know. But God's all-seeing knowledge penetrates every obstruction. He reads thoughts, he knows our motives, we know that well enough. When Christ our Saviour was on earth, there were great examples of his knowing the thoughts of his disciples and those around him. There was a very famous case before World War II of a particular Oxford professor who claimed some uh, command over telepathy and he would hold very well-known dinner parties with very sophisticated people and they would come along and he would try to demonstrate his telepathic powers and people would try to catch him out and figure out how he did it. But even his closest friends said that at best his efforts were no more successful than the average stage thought reader or conjurer or trickster. It was trickery rather than power or gift. Of course it was. No one can read the thoughts of another. But God knows all things. His knowledge is all-seeing, penetrating knowledge. It's eternal knowledge, of course. This astonishing thing with Almighty God is he knows everything that has ever happened, is happening right now, and will happen in the future all at the same time. He has everything in his view. It's beyond our comprehension. He is never in a muddle. He knows exactly what he's doing. But the vast, vast, infinite, eternal mind knows all things all the time. That is the knowledge and the wisdom of God. Everything is fresh in the eternal mind. Everything is seen at a glance. Things not yet, and things that could have been. Now this may not have been, not be of the greatest practical value, but God knows everything that might have been. If the what ifs of life had happened, what if we had lost World War II, to mention that event again. What would have happened? What would have been the course of history? And what would have been the outcome of all the other what-ifs that would only have happened if we had, the result of the war had been quite different? Well, we can speculate at a superficial level on a few things, but God knows it all to the nth degree all the time. What would have happened if you'd have married somebody else? What would have happened if, if, if? Astonishing that God knows everything, even the things that aren't going to happen or that won't happen. Dear friends, arms race, will an arms race bring about chaos yet in world history as we move towards the end? God knows exactly, of course an arms race it won't end the world. The return of Jesus Christ will end the world. Everything is under God's control. It won't be a bomb. It won't be uh, an ecological incident or global warming that brings all things to an end. It'll be the hand of God. These things, for all I know, and I'm not giving you a judgment on them, I'm not competent to do that, but these things may be true and they may happen and they may go on and they may get out of control. But that where they won't be the cause of the end. But God knows exactly. And he knows his timing. He's landlord of the universe. He knows which economies are going to collapse. He knows if there will suddenly be dirty bombs coming onto the open arms market and making havoc in the world. God knows 
everything. We can only fear it or guess at it. The eternal knowledge never fades. God is never unconscious. God is never asleep. God never forgets. His knowledge is alive in his mind all the time. So God knew the fall. God knew that mankind would rebel against him and fall and lose its privileges and come under judgment and make havoc in his world. God knew exactly what would happen to man, that he'd come under judgment, that he'd throw away his soul, that he'd become alienated from God. And so God already had a plan to save man or countless millions of men who would come to him and repent of their sin. And he planned to send Christ, the second person of the Trinity, into this world to suffer and to die on Calvary to pay the price of sin for all who will repent because of the operation of the Spirit in their hearts. God knew the fall. He knew what he would do. He knew how he would teach the human race. Just think of it. Before the world was created, before the world fell, God knew that he would select the Jews to be a kind of sample of what mankind would be. He took the Jewish nation, Israel, to train them in morality and teaching about himself, to bring the Savior through that race into the world, to prepare the way for Christ, and at the same time, to demonstrate to mankind the fallen character of his heart. Do you know this? That down the history of the Old Testament, God did wonderful things for that nation, and they rebelled against him time after time, and he appealed to them, and he showed them miracles, and he protected them at times, and exposed them to punishments at other times. And no matter what he did with them and for them, with mighty demonstrations of his goodness and power, and sometimes giving them up to their own wills, they would not turn to him. They would not turn to him. They would not turn. That's, they were a sample. If you were to die tonight or next week, a rebel against God, and you were to go before him in judgment, and let us suppose you said to him, which of course you wouldn't, you'd be terrified and you'd know that you were justly condemned but if you were somehow to have the impertinence and the power to say to God, oh, but uh, if I had seen miracles and if I had had the voice of God speaking to me directly and if, then it would have been different. So it's not fair that I should be judged. Do you know what God would say to you? Well, this is hypothetical, of course. God would say, oh, no. There were hundreds of thousands, millions of people in the Jewish nation and I did just that for you, for them, as a demonstration to all posterity, that though I give bread from heaven and water from the rock and mighty miracles, though I give astonishing deliverances and answer their cries and show mercy upon mercy, mankind will not, will not, will not turn to me and listen and come to me. So there's no excuse for you. You wouldn't have been any different if I'd given you a great voice from heaven, if I'd shown you amazing miracles. Would have made absolutely no difference. Yes, the Jewish nation was very privileged, and through there were many godly people among them, and through them came the Messiah. But as people as a whole, they're also a demonstration of the unreasonableness of our human hearts before God. God's knowledge, God plans all these things, and that's a kind of digression. But God, before the world began, provided a savior for us. Of course, God's knowledge is unlearned knowledge. There are various passages of scripture which point this out. It's a wonderful one in Isaiah 40. It's here in the New Testament also. Who taught him? Who instructed him? No one, because God's knowledge 
didn't have to be learned by him. He's not like us at all. God didn't need to conduct any experiments to know how to do science on a massive scale and how to create the world. With God, it's intuitive knowledge because he is God. He's the eternal, infinite, genius God. We cannot explain it. He's from eternity to eternity. He has all knowledge. Nobody gave him any lectures. He did not need to do any revision, as we do, for some examination. He is knowledge. He is the truth. You have to understand that. This is the God, the mighty God, to whom we will not bow the knee. We're so proud of ourselves. Don't talk to me about God, we say. I'm in for this world. I'm going to succeed. I think I'm a great one, and I'm going to make a success of it. And we will not bow the knee to God, who is so high above us. It's an old saying which I love God knows by genesis, not by analysis. He just knows from the very beginning and always did everything that there is to know. He never had to learn. By genius, not toil. So God's way of salvation is perfect. It's bound to be. It's wonderful and it's perfect. He knew that we could never earn heaven for ourselves. We're too sinful and corrupt with all our pride and all our weaknesses and all our dishonesty and all our violence, whatever is our master sin, we could never make our own way to heaven. God knew that in his perfect knowledge and so he provided a savior and he made salvation by grace, undeserved, unearned, free, to all those who put their entire trust in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, and what he has done. That is according to the great knowledge of God. The scripture tells us that God also knows himself. Of course he does, but it's important to say this because we don't know ourselves. Don't you often say of somebody, he doesn't know himself. She doesn't know herself. She doesn't know her weaknesses. He doesn't know his tendencies. He doesn't know what he can do. He doesn't know himself and his limitations. Self-knowledge is a very important aspect of knowledge. God knows himself. That's why God will never let you off sin without repentance, without the Savior suffering for your sin on your behalf because he knows himself, he is perfect. He is perfect in holiness, perfect in judgment. He cannot act against his holy being and character. He must punish sin. And yet in his amazing love, he's come himself in the person of Christ to suffer and die for our sin if we believe in him. That's part of God acting in a way that is completely consistent with his character. He knows himself. God's knowledge, by the way, is not subject to any prejudice. You can't cry on his shoulder. Perhaps you do think this. Perhaps you think, oh, well, I shall be all right in the day of judgment. I think I've done some good things. I will cry on God's shoulder. I'll say, Lord, please forgive me because I did do this, I did do that. And you can't see your sins. We're proud people. God is not going to be moved by our tears. God has told us you're sinners. You're under condemnation. You need to repent and seek the Savior and receive a new life and spiritual life. And God is not going to be swayed by empty tears and such things as that. He will judge righteously. He's given a way of salvation. And that is what we must believe and trust in. Oh, time is rushing on. Let me tell you that God's knowledge is a concerned knowledge. Now, you know a lot of things, friends. This congregation, why, 
there must be people in here tonight educated in all kinds of fields who know all sorts of things, whether it's for your profession, your work, whatever. But there's a whole lot of things you know that don't have any concern attached to them. This is technical knowledge. You're not moved by it. These are practical things, maybe, or theoretical knowledge. Occasionally something may move you, but most of the knowledge that you have, it's not concerned knowledge, feelingful knowledge. Why, you see this, you watch the news. It's been a tragedy in some far off place. Umpteen people have perished. Terrible thing has happened. How must you feel about that? Well, we're all in this together. Well, it's a long way away. It isn't our country. It's not our people. We might say tut tut, but we don't feel very deeply. What a difference between us and God. God's knowledge is a concerned knowledge. There is a sense in which he feels about things. He saw the nations lie, all perishing in sin, and pitied the lost state this ruined world was in. That's Isaac Watts expressing it. And it's true. Almighty God felt for us in our foolishness the fall of man, his sin, his alienation from God, his being under judgment. And God felt with mighty, infinite compassion and sent a Savior to take our place and suffer and die and make a way of salvation for all who come to him. It's a concerned knowledge. God is not a gigantic computer with no feeling. He has pity and compassion and mercy and tenderness and he, as it were, throws open his arms and says, come, come and have mercy and forgiveness and new life. It's we who are cold and foolish. I don't want to listen to this. I'm not interested in this. I'm not interested in God and heaven and mercy and kindness and the wonders of God and the knowledge of God. We are the foolish ones. God is full of compassion. He reaches out to us, and when we come to us, he forgives us freely. When we come to him, he forgives us freely. He changes our hearts and our natures and our lives. He allows us to walk in communion with him and to pray to him and know his blessing and his power. He plans for us and guides us and strengthens us and helps us. He takes us safely all the way to the end of life's journey and into the eternal heavens where we shall be blessed forever. Oh, the feeling in the heart of God for unworthy, lost, tiny little people and sinners such as we are in his sight. So God's knowledge is a feeling for knowledge and a concerned knowledge you might say it's a long-suffering knowledge. Look at the long years through which he appealed to the Jewish nation, all recorded in the Old Testament portion of the Bible. How long-suffering, how many chances, how many chances he gives us. When did you first feel a burden in your heart that you should come to Jesus Christ? When did you first feel that you were a sinner in God's sight and you shook it off and you pushed it away. How many years have passed? How many mercies? How much kindness? How much patience? God knows all about you, but he has a long-suffering knowledge and a patient knowledge. And even though he knew before the world began how obdurate and obstinate and stubborn we would be and how long we'd refuse to turn to him, Yet Christ came to Calvary still, in spite of us, to suffer and to die and take our burden in his own body on the tree, all for what he would one day make of us and give to us, the knowledge of God. It's so long-suffering. Of course, in some degree, 
It's a recorded knowledge. That's what this Bible is about. In fact, that's partly what creation is about. Creation, among other things, is a kind of record of just some small part of the knowledge of God. Here it is displayed in the created order. What God can and has done and all the intricacy, which as I mentioned earlier in this message, we are trying to unfold and research and investigate, ever making new discoveries about how it all works and how it's all composed. But what is it but a demonstration of the power of God and his knowledge to design and create? So even the created order is a kind of record of just a bit of the mighty, infinite knowledge of God. But another part of his knowledge, higher knowledge, is here in the scriptures, in this revelation of God's ways and his standards and his desires and his acts in saving men and women and what he will do for us. It's recorded in the scripture and we can investigate it and look at it his plan, his remedy for sin, his way of free forgiveness through Christ, the coming judgment, how we should live for him, all these things are in this astonishing word of God. And this is self-authenticating knowledge. There is knowledge which authenticates itself. It is full of promises, the Bible, many of which have been fulfilled and are fulfilled to all who come to God. And it's full of prophecies, many of which are quite medium range, short term prophecies that have already been fulfilled, and some long term ones that concern the end of the world. And all those medium range, short range, term prophecies have been fulfilled to authenticate that this is the knowledge of God locked here, or some of it locked into this revelation. But most of all, I'd like to tell you, this is a surprising knowledge. The knowledge of God is a surprising knowledge. I've already said this in a way. I'd like to say it in another form. It's so surprising. When I first came to Christ as a youngster and I first understood what the message of salvation was, it was so surprising to me. It's not what I would have expected. I would have thought, and maybe you're the same, that for anybody to have God's kindness and a place in heaven and his favor, for anybody to secure those benefits, well, they'd have to earn them. They'd have to perform some religious ritual. They'd have to deserve and earn the blessing of God. It was a great surprise to find that God views things very differently that his knowledge is altogether different. He knows in his knowledge, I cannot do that. No action of mine, no good works of mine can make up for my past record of sin. Nothing can be perfect enough and good enough to even earn 1% a place in heaven and the blessings of God. God's knowledge knows that his forgiveness and the salvation of my soul must be an entirely free gift on his part because I simply trust in Christ and what he's done for me. Give my life to him and repent of my sin. God's knowledge is a surprising knowledge. He's conceived a way of salvation which is entirely free and gracious and kind. And if we find him if we come to him, then just think of the privilege of this. Your sins are forgiven. Your life is changed. You receive a new nature. You begin to have communion with God and walk with him. You have a place in heaven. And you know what? You are also given. It's a small share. But you are also given, even while here on earth, a share of the knowledge of God. It's only a small share. It's only as much as our small, finite minds can take. But to us, it's everything. 
to understand about God and his attributes and his ways and his plans. He shares them with us and his purposes in his word. And we can understand it and delight in it. Some, just some of the wonderful, mysterious knowledge of God becomes understandable to us and far more in eternal glory in the hereafter. Dear friends, my time is up. Seek the Lord. Humble yourself before him, the God of all knowledge. Receive his free salvation. Trust in Jesus Christ, who suffered and died to pay the price of sin for those who will be saved. Repent of all your sin and call upon him to come to you and change you and help you and make you his child. So that like Nicodemus was told by Christ so many years ago, we read in our second scripture reading, we are born again, born from above, totally changed. Come to him, the God of all knowledge. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out, and yet we are given something of an understanding of God's knowledge when we come to him. Let's pray together. Oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, deal with us. Leave us not in our ignorance. Oh Lord, bring us into this glorious salvation of the knowledge of God. Transform us, forgive us freely and help us Grant a blessing on all in this place tonight. O oh Lord, save and help. Leave none to this vain world, to a life of shallowness and emptiness, with only limited human knowledge. Come, Lord, in thy mighty power and bless our needy souls. We ask these things in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen.